Welcome to those from the U.S. and those from Germany. Many of you have seen, uh, have seen the U.S. drought monitor map, I'm sure. So we have been dry here in Oklahoma Panhandle, the Texas Panhandle, New Mexico, uh, since last fall. And the drought continues to expand to the west. Uh, we are getting a little bit of moisture today in uh, northwest Oklahoma, uh, but we're a long ways from being out of the woods. Eastern part of our state and the eastern part of the southern Great Plains is in, is in really good shape, and so there's a lot of variability uh, in the conditions and different cattle operations around uh, this region of the country. But, so what I'm going to talk about today is for those who are, you know, either now or in the future facing a potential severe drought situation like this is an alternative to maintain at least a core group of the cow herd um, using more of a dry lot feeding situation or, or management system. Um, and so, you know, we're not going to spend much time on, on uh, stocking raid in the middle of a drought situation and planning for a reduced stocking rate because, you know, that needs to be part of the normal management plan that is being prepared for drought situations. As we've talked about a lot in this grant project, uh, those conditions seem to be increasing in frequency over time. Uh, so an important part of a management plan is just to be prepared ahead of time, know what you're going to do, know what thresholds uh, will trigger different management, uh, in a, and generally speaking, that's going to be reducing your stocking rate so that you don't overgraze pastures as you enter into a drought. Um, and that is usually the best management option because feeding your way through a drought with most of or the entire cow herd is generally speaking not very cost effective. So we'll just say that right up front. This strategy, feeding a more of a grain-based diet to a group of cows in a dry lot is generally speaking for most people who don't have uh, really nice facilities or a, an empty feed yard next door that's, you know, that has uh, closed business and so would be available. Something like some unique situation like that, you know, might make it a, more of a cost effective option for a handful of people. But in most cases, this strategy would be used uh, as sort of a stopgap. Uh, strategy for folks who'd want to maintain core genetics or something like that in their cow herd. And everybody will have to decide whether, whether you're talking about main, hanging on to 50% of your cow herd or whether we're talking about trying to retain all of your two and three year old cows so that you don't have to give up your best, quote, best younger genetics you know, or whether you're just talking about hanging on to maybe 30% of the cow herd that represents that, that group that you consider to be the most valuable uh, set of genetics. So uh, that's going to be up to every operation and it will vary widely depending on the current situation. Uh, the principle here though is that when concentrate feeds are inexpensive relative to harvested forage, limited feeding can be an option to retain those core genetics. So, um, for example, this, this slide shows you relatively current feed values. I think I put this together about three weeks ago. And what it shows you <clears throat> is the value of each one of these different feed commodities if corn is worth $4.25 uh, so a bushel or $152 per ton, which it was uh, about three weeks ago. So that makes distillers dried grains, for example, worth $259 a ton. Well, last week we had a load delivered for $180. Consequently, that tells you that distillers dried grain is a pretty good value in terms of delivering 
uh, energy and protein to a beef cow. Um, wheat middlings right now you can purchase in our part of the world for around $130 a ton. It says the value on a $4.25 corn equivalent is $188. Consequently, you know, that, uh, uh, that's just another indication that a lot of these feed commodities are relatively inexpensive at this point in time, particularly in the case where forage or hay is limited after this long dry winter in our part of the country, uh, in this close to and in the middle of this drought region, especially after all those fires that gone through, uh, hay is very difficult to find and it's really expensive right at the moment. Uh, so that makes, uh, that makes uh, these concentrate feeds a good alternative from a cost standpoint. Okay, so if we're going to limit feed cows a concentrate diet, to, to, there are quite a few management things that need to be considered. Um, but here, here are some of the advantages. I probably already mentioned some of these, but here's one, one advantage is that it can provide a home for cows and keep you from overgrazing pastures during one of these drought situations. And it can be used in the spring, it can be used in the middle of the summer, the strategy can be used in the fall or it can be used in the dead of winter. So it, it provides having the capability to pull a group of cows or a big chunk of your cow herd into a dry lot provides tremendous flexibility uh, to take pressure off of your pastures. And you know, our range, all of our range management people will tell you that one of the really big issues during a drought is not to add insult to injury by overgrazing those drought stress pastures. Uh, so that's one, one way that this kind of strategy could help. Increase ranch stocking capacity. Uh, most people maybe, maybe not uh, be interested in using it for this purpose, but it is a possibility. Um, you know, for example, up in, in Nebraska the last few years, some of the uh, ranchers and, and uh, animal scientists up there have been telling us that pastures are renting for $50 per cow per month during the grazing season because a lot of that good farmland has been planted to corn. So pasture is hard to come by in the eastern half of Nebraska. It's very, very expensive. Uh, and consequently, they have shifted to a management system where some people are dry lotting cows through the growing season and turning them out on corn stalks through the winter. So they're using dry lot management there to increase the stocking capacity uh, and to be flexible based on uh, the really expensive pasture costs. Uh, limit feeding cows, in other words, restricting their nutrient intake uh, by the amount you feed them every day has been shown time and again to improve diet digestibility. So you get that improvement in efficiency. Um, also, when you limit feed animals less than what they would like to consume, you reduce uh, the, their gut size, basically, visceral organ mass, the liver shrinks, the intestine shrink, the rumen shrinks, and all of those tissues are uh, expensive tissues to maintain. And so you reduce uh, the cost of maintaining the cow because you reduce the size of those expensive organs from an expensive from an energy standpoint. Also activity de decreases. They don't have to walk half a mile or two miles to water and, and walk uh, several miles every day grazing. And so that further reduces their maintenance requirements by another 10 to 20 percent. Uh, you know, this is also can be viewed as an opportunity to when the cows are up in a dry lot during this period of time, you know, if the timing is right, you'd have the opportunity to implement other forms of technology such as artificial insemination, synchronization, so on and so forth. And then anything that goes through the into the feed bunk. Um, technology such as feed additives and of course limit feeding would be one of those. This is not a strategy that's for everyone. Uh, it requires more intensive management, uh, more labor. 
because you know the cows aren't out there grazing, taking care of themselves. They have to be fed every day. You have to have feed storage. You probably need to have some form of feed mixing uh, strategy and probably some sort of some feeding equipment. Uh, you need to have a dry lot or sacrifice pasture. Doesn't have to be fancy. Doesn't have to be a nice feed yard. Uh, it can be a, a barbed wire fence around a sacrifice pasture uh, somewhere, and the feeding feed bunks can be, you know, the eight or ten foot atwood style feed bunks. So it doesn't have to be fancy. <clears throat> this is just an example of a of a ration that we're using right now uh, in our dry lot program here at Oklahoma State. Uh, there are a thousand ways to go about this and, and um, you know, we just encourage people to work with a nutritionist to come up with a, a ration that works best in their situation given the resources uh, available. Uh, but here we've got about a third of this ration is Bermuda grass hay. And so a key to uh, this program is having some sort of a roughage source that basically provides health and safety to the cow's rumen. You cannot just feed straight grain, obviously. Rumen animals are not made to handle that very well. And you'll create acidosis and founder if this is not uh, taken care of. But in, in our case, we're feeding about a third ground hay. In Nebraska, they would use a lot of corn stalks, probably Kansas as well. Uh, some people could, in cotton production country, use whole co uh, cottonseed hulls, um, although they're, they're usually pretty expensive, but uh, peanut hulls is another good roughage source. Uh, but some sort of a roughage source would be required. Over on the right there, you can see the dry matter composition of this diet. You can see that it's dry. We don't have access to wet byproduct feeds like wet distillers grains or wet corn gluten feed. We don't have access here at our unit to corn silage, which would be relatively wet. Uh, so our ration is dry and it's dusty. We'll talk about that, uh, way to ways to get around that here in just a minute. Crude protein, 17.5%. A cow requires, a lactating cow requires about 11 to 12% crude protein if she's getting all she wants to eat. But we are limiting her intake to take advantage of those efficiencies and keep her from getting too fat. Consequently, when you limit the amount they eat, the protein and the mineral concentration needs to be higher. Uh, TDN of this diet is about 70%. Some people using this strategy might only use a ration that was in the neighborhood of uh, 60 to 65% digestibility. For example, real nice quality forage this time of year, uh, lush green grass would be in that 65 to 70% TDN range. Okay, facilities equipment considerations. This is probably the biggest issue uh, for many, uh, say moderate size ranches to implement this technology because they just may not have real nice facilities um, uh, to implement a strategy like this. So you need to have some method to limit the amount of roughage consumed daily. You cannot give animals free choice access to round bales of hay and make this strategy work. You have to limit the amount that the animals can consume some way in order for it to be cost effective. Roughage and concentrate portions, uh, they can be fed separately. So you could feed that, that third of the diet that I mentioned is Bermuda grass hay and ours, we could go through and feed it in the morning. If we had a way to measure out the amount we thought the cows needed, either out in the sacrifice pasture or in the feed bunk, and then we could come back in the afternoon or a couple of hours later after they've consumed the hay <clears throat> and feed uh, grain in a feed bunk or something. Uh, we're using a total mixed ration here um, because we, have, we do have a mixer unit and you know it, it that way we save one trip uh, feeding the animals we don't have to feed them once a day but people are going to have different resources but that is one flexibility that you have uh, this is our our um, truck with a vertical mixer um, this is an older model it's about a two it is a 2007 model but it's got two vertical rotary 
uh, mixers and the hay grinder inside that big tub. And we just, we, we can put about one, well, we can put one 1400 pound uh, round bale in there and it processes that hay to about uh, three to six inch particle size. And then we go ahead and put our grain and liquid molasses and everything on top of that and keep it running and let it blend and, and feed it. Uh, so another issue is uh, storage. Uh, this is a building that we poured these concrete slabs in. We, we poured, uh, so particularly for a total mixed ration or for feed commodities and ground hay, you're going to need storage like this. Uh, it, further east you go, the more you need it. Uh, further west you go, some people could probably get by storing ground hay, for example, outside. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to make the point here that we poured these slabs ourselves. Uh, these are 25, each, there's two 25 foot by 60 foot sections uh, here. Uh, you can see split by that pillar in the barn. And each section cost about $3,000 of concrete to pour and we provided our own labor. So we've got uh, about 20 foot of concrete outside in other words, not under the roof of this barn. And we just, we just uh, poured that pad on the outside there so that we'd have plenty of room to drop some ration or feed out there outside and then push it in the barn with the front end loader. And that's, that's really nice. But anyway, just wanna make the point that if you've got an existing barn, it's really not terribly expensive uh, to add a concrete slab. This is an, <clears throat> an older mixing unit uh, vertical or I'm sorry horizontal mixing unit uh, here with if you're going to use a unit like this you're going to have to have processed hay to begin with the vertical mixer I showed you is designed to process the hay so that eliminates one step you don't have to have somebody come through and grind the hay for you or or purchase a hay grinder with this unit uh, they're less expensive uh, but you have to have some way to process the roughage if you're going to use hay or corn stalks or something like that. You're going to need a front end lower loader with each one, either one of these uh, uh, feeder styles. Uh, this is an older, smaller unit. We, we purchased both of the, the little tractor and the little mixer uh, for about $10,000. And that's about a 440 cubic uh, foot mixer, as I recall. Uh, and then I've also got a note there about overhead storage, and that's the one thing um, of the equipment needed for this uh, strategy that most ranches already have, at least down here in Oklahoma, is an overhead storage bin like that. And we just had rolled corn delivered and, and put in that grain bin, and that, that bin holds a, a semi-load. Okay, I mentioned processing hay if a ranch if that's a home raised feed source and you want to use it in a strategy like this, uh, which that's, that's going to be the primary roughage source in the Southern Great Plains, um, folks to process hay are a lot more or businesses like the one shown in this business card here are a lot more abundant available now than they used to be. Uh, as I mentioned here in the text above the business card, uh, this company's got five units, five big uh, semi truck and trailer units that come through and grind hay for people. They can grind, oh, I don't know, they can probably grind 60 plus bales an hour, maybe, maybe faster than that. But uh, they come through our area about every other week. And if you want to get on their schedule, you just contact them. And so uh, I think yeah, it mentions the uh, minimum setup charge there and then anywhere from eight to $11 a bale, depending on how many bales of hay you've got to grind and how far they have to travel. So that'll give you an idea of what that costs. And, and you know, most people are not going to be able to stand the depreciation on purchasing a hay grinder unless it's a really large operation. So, uh, to get you through a short drought period, this is a terrific alternative. 
Okay, let's talk about dry rations uh, like the one uh, that we're using now. I uh, said we don't have a lot of wet byproduct feeds or corn silage. These rations are 8 to 12% moisture with grain and ground hay. Uh, that creates a problem if you mix grain with ground hay and you put it in a feed bunk, those cows learn to try to sort it and eat the grain first. That's kind of the ice cream and you're asking them to eat the ice cream and spinach at the same time. Uh, so in order to reduce that, we use a liquid molasses product to help eliminate that problem. Our ration includes 7.5%. You can probably uh, include a liquid molasses product in the range of 5 to 10%. But the other thing we learned from our dairy, and doesn't cost hardly anything other than just a little bit of time, uh, you know, you have to purchase the water, but we pull up to the water hydrant and we add an additional 35% weight as water immediately prior to feeding. And that makes a really nice looking wet ration. It doesn't have any time to spoil because we go out there and feed it right away. We're limit feeding this ration so the cows have it completely cleaned up within two hours and it nearly eliminates their ability to sort. It eliminates the dust. Uh, it's just been a really nice improvement in our limit feeding strategy here at Oklahoma State. Okay, so general feeding management. Uh, so these, these are, we're going to use the example of 1,150 pound mature cows. You obviously want to adjust these feeding rates based on your cow size. Uh, dry cows with the ration I'm, sh I'm sharing with you here today, uh, 12 pounds to a dry cow is enough to maintain, and actually they'll gain a little bit of body weight with 12 pounds. Uh, I think our ration was costing $150 a ton before we added the water, so about 90% dry matter, and that gets you to about 90, 90 cents cost per head per day to hang on to those cows in the dry lot if they're not lactating. We're feeding them that, uh, that 12 pounds is about, you know, just a little bit over 1% of their body weight. Uh, lactating cows, it takes about 20 pounds because of the additional maintenance requirement during lactation because it takes protein and energy to produce the milk. Uh, so 20 pounds, it'll just about hold their body condition and their weight. In fact, they'll gain just a little bit over time with 20 pounds of feed. Uh, that's costing us about $1.50 a day. The feeding rate on these cows then is about 1.7% of body weight. We're, we're feeding once in the morning and getting along really well with that strategy. You know, if you had, if you, if you're available or you have labor available, you could certainly feed half of this amount in the morning and half in the late afternoon or something if you chose to do that. And it would probably uh, reduce any, further reduce any risk of, of digestive upset by doing that. Uh, you'd have to feed consistently the same time every day. Whichever strategy you choose, uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot wait and feed the, well, feed the animals in the morning uh, several days a week and then wait and feed them in the afternoon on Sunday or something like that. You're asking for uh, bloat and founder if you if you do not keep it consistent. This is a real simple adaptation strategy. You can't just start overnight feeding, uh, let's say a set of cow-calf pairs, you can't just put, pull them in out of the pasture, shut the gate, and dump 20 pounds of feed in front of them the next day because it's relatively high in concentrate uh, compared to what they've been getting. You have to give their room and time to adjust. And so what we do is uh, we just either give them early on, give them free choice access to hay and gradually reduce that access over time while we're gradually bumping the amount of, of this total mixed ration that we provide. Uh, or in cases here where we're feeding a total mixed ration like this that's completely blended and we have the capability to adding more hay, we'll just feed uh, for five days the 75-25 mix, hay and TMR. Um, and then the next five days, we'll feed a 50-50, the next five days, 25-75, and then on day 16, 
you're up to 100% TMR, uh, such as the example ration I showed you here early on. Okay, cows need about 30, 36% of bunk space. Uh, if the calves don't have a creep area, we suggest 36 inches so they can get up there and eat with the cows. Uh, if they do have a creep area, uh, hopefully they'll spend more time in there and let the cows have the majority of the feed and you only need about 30 inches of bunk space. We're feeding in our creep area the exact same ration. So we don't go buy a special creep. Uh, at 17.5% crude protein, it's a very calf, and 70% digestibility, it's a very lightweight calf appropriate ration. Okay, so it works really good as a creep feed for these calves, just, just as it does a limit feeding um, product for the cows. Uh, so I mentioned they can eat with the cows or creep area. Uh, with free choice creep feed, these calves will learn to eat a lot over a period of about 60 to 90 days and they'll begin to get fleshy. Uh, consequently, if you have the capability of limiting the amount to the calves, that's what we suggest. And we're feeding about one and a quarter percent of the calves body weight per day in that creep area. And this year, this last winter, those calves gained two and a half pounds a day on this ration that I shared with you. So very good performance and very efficient feed conversion. Uh, most of the operations using this strategy, if they've got the cows pulled into a dry lot and they're feeding them during a drought period, they'll go ahead and pull the calves off somewhere around 120 to 150 days. You don't have to, and if you're limit feeding the calves creep intake, uh, you can probably go on out to 200 days with no problem. If you have to feed it free choice uh, going that long, those calves are going to get really big and really fleshy. Okay, so I mentioned feed costs. Uh, here's uh, here's uh, examples of that. 120 days uh, for lactating cows. Uh, most our most recent ration cost that was about 180 bucks. Um, <clears throat> let's see the feed cost for the calf at that one and a quarter percent of body weight was about 34 dollars. Uh, said the calves are gaining about two and a half pounds a day. Total feed cost for that 120 days then is $214. And then I, I just compared that to feeding straight hay in a protein supplement. You know, in best case scenario, those calves might gain one and three quarter pounds a day if you're just free choice and hay to the cows and feeding a supplement. And the feed cost there is $206. So you've got a lot more, probably a lot more labor in the limit feeding option. Uh, it requires a lot more equipment and so on, but at the end of the day, you've used a lot less hay, and if that is the limiting resource, that's really the point of this whole thing, is we've, we've gotten those cows through a drought period for about the same cost, at least the same feed cost, uh, and we've only used, mm, probably only used about 25% of the forage or roughage we would have had to have if they were getting free choice hay or, or grazing pasture. Okay, Amber, I'm gonna stop there. That's, I kind of go into some uh, saving hay kind of things, a little bit unrelated, but I thought, I thought maybe I'd stop there and see if there are any comments or questions. Okay. Um... So once again, you guys can use the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can see a little, a little chat bubble. If you click on that, you can type any questions that you have for Dave about limit feeding um, or probably any other drought-related cattle feeding questions. Um, I have a question just because I'm curious about that calculation. Um, cause you, you had that $216 for your mixed ration and yes. only 206 for the hay. Yep. Is that a reasonable price to expect hay to be at in a context where there's a shortage? Mm. 
So I've got at four, I've got hay price here at four cents a pound. Well, you know, eighty dollars a ton. Uh, you can't you can't find hay right now in western Oklahoma in the Texas Panhandle for yeah, probably if you can find it, it's probably going to be a hundred dollars a ton, maybe a hundred and twenty. In 2011, 2012, hay got up to $150 a ton. Uh, so, so yeah, that's going to be, you know, the more severe the drought situation, the longer the drought situation, so the hay supplies are depleted, the more expensive it's going to be. And so, you know, we're, we're just lucky or fortunate that a lot of times when there's a drought in this region of the country, the corn belt may actually be in pretty good shape. And so that creates this situation where you have really expensive forage and really ex inexpensive or reasonably priced concentrate feed. And so, you know, we, we just wanted to let, you know, uh, let people know that this is an alternative to take advantage of that in this region uh, on occasion. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, can you see that question or do you want me to? I, uh, no, I don't have it. Up okay, question. it says, is it difficult to convince some cattlemen to dry limit feeding? Um, would guess some might be unwilling to at least try it. Yeah, it, yeah, no question. And, and I don't, you know, we don't try to push this on people. Uh, but because, if, you know, if you have to go out and buy a bunch of this stuff, pour concrete, buy a mixer, uh, feed bunks, uh, build a pen, you know, it's just not going to work. It's just too much equipment, overhead, depreciation, labor, no way. But some people have already got a pen. Some people have already got feed storage areas. Some people already have overhead feed storage and feed bunks. And so, by just adding one or two pieces to this to this system, you know they might be able to spend just a little bit of money and increase their ranch flexibility to take advantage of these uh, situations and especially during a drought period. So yeah, we we don't try to talk people into it. We just try to make them aware that you know this is a management strategy that works takes good management and occasionally it can be extremely helpful. Um, cactus feed yards, for example, have 8,000 cows <laughs> in this system year round for crying out loud. They've decided uh, that they can put cows in a feed yard and manage them this way and make it cash flow. Interesting, because I think that that was, I, I think, to me, one of the more interesting points is, like, this probably isn't going to be cost-effective unless you're doing it on a very limited number of cows um, in these drought sort of situations. Yeah, well, I mean, if you have access to rent reasonably priced pasture, you know, I said the Nebraska group was paying $50 a month during the grazing season, uh, this is very competitive with that. On the other hand, if you can go rent pastures on a, for a cow for 20 or $30 a month, you know, this system is not, is not going to even come close to the, the um, you know, profitability of the pasture. If in Oklahoma, a lot of this grazing land, though, is selling for, I don't know what it is in Kansas, Amber, but here it's, it's $1,200 to $2,000 per acre and it takes 10 acres to run a cow. And so you pencil that out and gosh, with land costs continuing to go up, uh, you could use partial confinement a uh, few months of the year, increase your stocking capacity and, and certainly make it work compared to going buying more land. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's, I mean, those are the things that come out in the, the economics of it is it all depends on what your, your limiting factor is at some point, whether that's the cost of forage or the cost of land or how you're going to access that to figure out what actually pencils out and becomes profitable long-term. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, there, 
if if a person's primary skill set is finding reasonably priced pasture and managing grazing systems on pasture, uh, you know, this is not, this is obviously not going to be a strategy that fits into that kind of a mindset or operation. Uh, on the other hand, if you're, if you're limited on land availability in your area, and it's, if it's extremely expensive, uh, but uh, so let's say a, perhaps a young producer that is not afraid to think outside of the box, you know, they might be able to expand just a little bit on their facilities, um, equipment, and so on, you know, not get too crazy, but expand just a little bit and add, they could add perhaps 20 to 25% stocking capacity to their ranch, uh, taking advantage of these reasonably priced feed commodities. And then, as I said, you know, also that <clears throat> kind of the topic of discussion here today is provide flexibility during these drought periods.